Insights from Chapter 1 Number 1. People's experiences, their upbringing, their status, and other factors shape their view of the world and how it functions. All experiences and views are different. Number 2. Some lessons have to be experienced before they can be understood. You can try to understand others' situations, but you cannot really get it unless you go through it yourself. Number 3. People should make investment decisions based on their goals and the characteristics of the investment options available to them at the time. However, economists have found that people's investment decisions are heavily anchored to their experiences in their own generation. Number 4. People from different backgrounds have different experiences. They see the world differently. They have different ideas about what money is and how it should be used. Opinions on lottery tickets and sweatshops are prime examples of differing views. Number 5. People who don't have a lot of money are more likely to buy a lottery ticket than people who do have a lot of money because it is the only way they can dream of achieving a financially comfortable life. Number 6. The modern foundation of money decisions, such as saving and investing, is based around concepts that are still new, which explains why so many people are not good at managing finances. Insights from Chapter 2 Number 1. Bill Gates is incredibly smart, very hardworking, and as a teenager had a vision for computers that even most trained computer executives could not understand. He was also lucky enough to be able to attend Lakeside School, which had a computer. Number 2. Luck and risk are both the reality that guides every outcome in life. But both are so hard to measure and hard to accept that they too often go overlooked. Respecting them helps you realize that judging financial success is never as good or as bad as it seems. Number 3. When judging others, attributing success to luck makes you look jealous and mean, even if luck is known to exist. When judging yourself, attributing success to luck can be too demoralizing to accept. Number 4. Identifying the traits we should emulate or avoid in successful people is hard to do. Learning by imitating others is not a way to success. Number 5. Many fortunes are based on leverage and overworking employees. The line between boldness and recklessness is very thin and can easily be crossed, only to be realized in hindsight. Number 6. Risk and luck are doppelgangers. The difficulty in identifying what is luck, what is skill, and what is risk is one of the biggest problems faced when trying to learn about the best way to manage money. Number 7. Be careful who you praise and admire. Be careful who you look down upon and wish to avoid becoming. Number 8. Focus less on specific individuals and case studies and more on broad patterns. Studying specific people is dangerous because the focus tends to fall on extreme individuals. Number 9. When successful, realize that things are not as good as you think. When you fail, do not think your decisions were terrible when sometimes they just reflect the unforgiving realities of risk. Insights from Chapter 3 Number 1. Enough entails blurred limits in today's society, and not having enough has its own dangers. Number 2. Rajat Gupta, a wealthy businessman born in poverty, committed fraud to gain quick and easy money. He ended up in prison, his previous business success destroyed by his thirst for riches. Bernie Madoff, followed a similar fraudulent path and ended up in jail. 
Number three. Rich people commit fraud to get money they didn't have and didn't need. Always remember, you don't need to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need. Number four. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. Manage your expectations and don't constantly strive for more. Number five, you must accept that you might have enough and not compare yourself to others. Number six, enough is not too little. An insatiable hunger for more will lead to eventual regret. Number seven, Things like family, reputation, happiness, freedom, and independence are never worth risking, no matter the gain. Insights from Chapter 4 Number 1. You don't need tremendous force to create tremendous results. Even something small can lead to something big. Number 2. Warren Buffett is the richest investor ever, and his success comes from the long time he spent investing. He started small at a very young age and continued accumulating relatively small annual gains. He only retired when he turned 60. This period is the key to his riches. This technique is called compounding. Number three. The counterintuitiveness of compounding may be responsible for many financial disappointments. Investing isn't about earning the highest returns in a short period of time. It's about earning good returns that can be repeated over a long period of time. Insights from Chapter 5 Number 1. There's only one way to stay healthy, a combination of frugality and paranoia. Number two, getting money requires taking risks, being optimistic, and putting yourself out there. But keeping money requires the opposite of taking risks, humility, fear, and frugality. It requires survival. Compounding is key to survival. Number three, you should want to be financially unbreakable more than wanting to earn big returns. If you're unbreakable, then you will earn the biggest returns because you will be able to stick around long enough for compounding to do its job over a longer period of time. Number four. Planning is important, but the most important part of every plan is to plan on the plan, not going according to plan. Number five, you should adopt a barbelled personality, one where you remain optimistic about the future, but keep a certain level of paranoia about the obstacles that might hurdle your plans. Insights from Chapter 6 Number one, the farthest ends of a distribution of outcomes, known as long tails, have a big influence in finance. In other words, a small number of events can account for the majority of outcomes. Number two. Most things that are huge, profitable, and famous are the result of a tail event. It is a rare and powerful occurrence, and it applies to large public stocks as well as venture capital. Number three. The idea that a few things account for most results is not just true for companies in your investment portfolio. It's also an important part of your own behavior as an investor. Number four. An investing genius is a man or woman who can do the average thing when all those around them are going crazy. Number five. In business, investing, and finance, most things go wrong, break, fail, or fall. It's normal. Insights from Chapter 7 Number 1. We all want to be happy, 
Happiness is complicated, but it has a shared universal element, having control of one's life. Number two, reactance is when people feel disempowered to do certain tasks because they are being imposed on them by someone else rather than their own choice. Number three, the USA is the richest nation in history, but Americans aren't much happier than they were in the past. This is because its people are stressed out because it has the most managerial jobs. These are jobs where you are expected to think all the time, even after the workday is done. Number four. Compared to previous generations, control over your time has diminished. It shouldn't be surprising that people don't feel much happier, even though, on average, people are richer than ever. Time remains the biggest dividend money has to offer. Insights from Chapter 8 Number 1. Humility, kindness, and empathy will bring you more respect than fancy items that can be bought with money to impress other people. Insights from Chapter 9 Number 1. Wealth is not fancy cars and expensive homes. It is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. Wealth is what you don't see. Number two. Many people appear to be humble and modest, but they are actually wealthy. Many people appear to be rich, but they are actually on the edge of bankruptcy. Insights from Chapter 10 Number 1. Past a certain level of income, people fall into three groups. Those who save, those who don't think they can save, and those who don't think they need to save. Number 2. Becoming wealthy has less to do with income or investment returns, and more to do with savings rate. Number 3. The value of wealth is relative to what a person needs. Number four. Spending beyond a low level of materialism is mostly a reflection of an egotistical approach to spending. Those who spend that way do it to show people that they have money. Number five. People are more in control of their savings than they think they are. Number six. You don't need a specific reason to save. Number seven. Having more soft skills puts you at an advantage. Having more control over your time and options is becoming one of the most valuable currencies in the world. Insights from Chapter 11 Number one. Do not aim to be purely a rational person. Try to be more reasonable than rational. Number two. A doctor named Julius Wagner Warreg noticed that some people with syphilis got better under the effect of fever. While this is true, people remain reasonably fearful of fevers to this day because fever hurts. Wanting a fever to cure infections is rational, but it is not reasonable. Number three. A rational investor makes decisions based on numeric facts. A reasonable investor makes them based on social context and consideration. Not all theoretical strategies are reasonable in real life. Number four. If you love your investments, you're more likely to stick with them when they're going through a rough patch. You don't have to be emotionless. It's better to love your investments. Insights from Chapter 12 Number 1. Economic history should not be heavily used as a map for future decisions. Investing is not a hard science. It is full of surprises and imperfect decisions made by people. Number 2. Relying heavily on investment history will most likely make you miss the most important outlier events 
that move the needle the most in the economy and the stock market. Number three, the most important future economic events will be unprecedented events. Their unprecedented nature means we won't be prepared for them, which makes them so impactful. Number four, history can be a misleading guide to the future of the economy and stock market because today's world is different from the past and the future will be even more different from it. More recent history is a more accurate guide than distant history. Insights from Chapter 13 Number 1. You should always plan while keeping in mind that things might go wrong. Always have room for error. Randomness and chance are always present in life. Number 2. Room for error is often seen as an unwillingness to take risks. However, it's advantageous to leave room for error in order to endure hardships. Number three, investors should think about room for error in three domains, volatility, retirement, and future returns. Number four, avoiding single points of failure where many elements depend on one thing to succeed, is essential to avoid great damages that can easily lead to catastrophe. Number five, the biggest single point of failure with money is solely relying on a paycheck without having savings on the side for the future. Insights from Chapter 14 Number one, you should envision your goals while taking into consideration life's stresses along the way. Keep your goals realistic. Number two, long-term financial planning is essential, but things change on all levels, and people very often end up doing things that they had not planned to do at a younger age. Number three, you should avoid the extreme ends of financial planning, namely working too hard for a high income or working for low income and presuming you'll be happy. Aim to have decent annual savings, free time, and moderate time with your family in order to avoid regrets. Number four, you should accept the reality that our minds change over time and move on fast in order to achieve a new goal. Insights from Chapter 15 Number 1. Every job looks easy when you're doing it because you don't know what the real challenges are. Many things are harder in practice than in theory, but we don't realize that because we're not good at identifying what the price of success is. Number two, successful investing has a price that should be paid, not in money, but in volatility, fear, doubt, uncertainty, and regret. Number three, the price of investment returns is not obvious to most people because it is not a clear price tag. The trick is to convince yourself that these fees are worth it in order to stick around long enough to gain from investments. Insights from Chapter 16 Number 1. Financial bubbles occur when the momentum of short-term returns attracts enough money that most of the investments change from long-term to short-term. The dot-com bubble that came with the rise of the Internet is an example of that. Number two, bubbles become dangerous when long-term investors start taking their investment cues from traders who are playing the short-term game. Number three, it's easy to be influenced by what other people do, but we don't know why they do what they do, so we shouldn't copy them. You should identify your own game and stick with it. Insights from Chapter 17 Number 1. 
pessimism is more common than optimism. It sounds smarter, and it's more captivating, while optimism tends to be viewed as being oblivious to risk. Number two, pessimism is common because money is a systemic entity that affects almost all people. Number three, the pessimist extrapolates present trends without accounting for how markets adapt. Number four, pessimism in the economy is valid because progress happens too slowly to notice, but setbacks happen too quickly to ignore. Number five, pessimism is also seductive because if we expect things to be bad, we get pleasantly surprised when they turn out well. Insights from Chapter 18 Number 1. Stories are the most powerful force in the economy. They can let the tangible parts of the economy work or hold them back. Number 2. The more you want something to be true, the more likely you are to believe a story that overestimates the odds of it being true. These appealing fictions have a big impact on how people think about money, particularly investments in the economy. Number three, the bigger the gap between what you want to be true and what you need to be true to have an acceptable outcome, the more you're protecting yourself from falling victim to an appealing financial fiction. This is why margins of error are essential. Number four, everyone has an incomplete view of the world, but we form a complete narrative to fill in the gaps. These supposedly complete stories have an impact on the economy. Number five, Coming to terms with how much you don't know is not easy because it means coming to terms with how much of what happens in the world is out of your control. Insights from Chapter 19 Number 1. There are universal truths in money. Even if people come to different conclusions about how they want to apply those truths to their own finances, Insights from Chapter 20 Number 1. There is no universal truth in finance. You have to find what works for you, even if the person counseling you does not adopt the same techniques as you. Number 2. Morgan Housel and his family have a fairly high savings rate, and they have set their lifestyle goal at a pace where they can live a nice and comfortable lifestyle. Number three, every investor should pick a strategy that has the highest odds of successfully meeting their goals. Number four, Housel's ultimate goal in investment is the mastery of the psychology of money. Insights from Postscript. Number one, to understand the attitudes of the modern American consumer, it is essential to look at the history of the economy, which has oscillated between good and bad. Number two. After World War II, the American economy was uncertain. Millions of soldiers were returning home to no jobs, and jobs that had been part of the war effort were suddenly halted. Marriage rates also spiked. America was entering some sort of recession period. Number three, the government made it easy for Americans to borrow money by keeping interest rates low and by making consumer debt tax deductible. Consumption became a cornerstone of the economy. Number four, pent-up demand for stuff and Americans' newfound ability to make stuff created the jobs that put returning soldiers back to work. That in addition to consumer credit, made Americans' capacity for spending explode. Number five. Between the 1950s and the 1980s, 
the gap between the rich and the poor became smaller and the wages of the poor increased. In addition, minorities gained some advantages. Lifestyle and social classes were leveled out to a certain extent. Number six, people measure their well-being against their peers. Number seven, household debt increased from 1947 to 1957 due to the combination of the new consumption culture, new debt products, and low interest rates. But the debt's impact wasn't severe because the income growth was also strong at the time. Number eight. In 1973, the USA entered a new recession. Inflation surged and interest rates hit a high. The economy was still growing, but it was more uneven. Number 9. Between 1993 and 2000, the economy saw another boom, but this time it was benefiting the top 1%, while the poorer population barely witnessed an increase. Sharp inequality appeared, but the post-World War II economic ideals remained. Number 10. When the rich got richer, they broke away from the common American lifestyle and started buying bigger and fancier houses, cars, etc. American society as a whole started following this trend, which increased loans tremendously and with them household debt. Number 11. The economy works better for some people than others. Success isn't based on merit anymore, and when someone succeeds, they are rewarded greatly. The post-war lifestyle stuck with Americans even though their reality was changing, and it still sticks with those who want to bring it back. We hope you enjoyed insights from Morgan Housel's The Psychology of Money. Purchase the book to learn more.